Hello and welcome to Disconnect. Today we are going to be talking about... Actually, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. Have you chosen a topic? You're going to do it like this now? I thought that's the spirit of it, right? It's freewheeling. It's absolutely off the cuff, right? Okay, <laughs> so what we're going to discuss today is are Indian customers actually brand conscious or brand loyal? And my spin on this is that we are looked at as people who are very price conscious. It's not true. I think we are mostly unconscious. <laughs> no, I can't say that. I can't say that. No, I think we are irrevocably value conscious above all else. Absolutely. Right? So anybody who says that Indian customers are brand loyal may be true for people who are buying like the really premium hmm. cars. Right. Or bikes, right? Hmm. So I can understand somebody saying I am loyal to Porsche, hmm. Lamborghini, Ferrari. I am loyal to Maruti though. Hmm. As much as the numbers are whatever, 48% market share or whatever. I don't think people are loyal to Maruti, Hyundai and those brands. Right. And it's true for motorcycles also. Hmm. I know people who've bought their fourth Splendor and they think it's an upgrade because the third one was old and the fourth one is new, right? Right. I don't think they're loyal to Hero as a company. I it's think Splendor that appeals to It's them. loyal to the product. And I think it's loyalty is coming from the idea of value that they associate with the product rather than the brand it's from. Right. I'm not saying there is no brand value, hmm. but I'm saying in the pecking order, hmm. brand sits lower than the idea of this product is value. Hmm. For example, the Nissan Magnite. All right. Uh, the reason why I'm picking on the Magnite uh, as an example is because if you look at what Nissan's been able to do in the country so far, their sales are not something that you'd write to Japan about, right? There's nothing to scream from the rooftops about. And they've been around for a long time. They've been around for a long time. And there was, it, you remember there was this discussion where the dealers were protesting, this internet drama was going on saying, oh, Nissan's about to shut down and all of this. And they've been here before and they're still fighting for that last 1% market share. Then the Magnite happens. And then what happens to Nissan after that? Like they're back in the business. Right. To me, that correlates directly to the fact that do we not understand that Nissan is Japanese, they make great engines and all of that? Yes, we do. Is that really important to us? Not until they produce a product that offers us a sense of value. And this is a particularly interesting example that you've chosen because... And, and you're right, right on two counts, bang on over there, because it's not the first time, right, that they were in that situation. The time before this, when they were in that situation, was when they got brand Dats into India, right, which was a sub-brand, so to speak, for developing markets, and they made bespoke vehicles in that sense for the Indian market. The first two were the Go, Ready Go, and uh, the Go Plus, right? And uh, then it was ready, already gone. <laughs> the From ready-go to already gone went quickly. <laughs> it already went. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, those products, they were, I think, great price points, great sizes for those price points uh, and approach, but did they hit a spot? No, they didn't. And which is exactly what the Magnite has managed to do. And the, and the interesting thing is that the Magnite was supposed to be a Datsun, right? But then they packed up the Datsun brand. But this product was not a product that felt compromised, right? Mm. You felt like the brand was treating you right. It held you in esteem and gave you a product that uh, matched that, right? Mm. And in that sense, straight away winner. And if you go further back, right, uh, the Duster. It came from Renault. It was a runaway success in that sense. It made Renault a household name, made it desirable, right? You had a Duster, right? Despite the interiors... And you know the irony of it? Uh, so, uh, Bertie and I, uh -huh. we were at Overdrive at that point. We were in Italy, I think, for a motor show. I'm not, I'm not remembering correctly. But we picked up a duster. Uh -huh. I'm going to say a year and a half before the duster came to the country. We drove this duster from Italy to Maranello, picked up a Ferrari, did a story on that, uh -huh. and drove the duster back. Uh -huh. And we were aware that Renault India was thinking about the duster for India. And that car was nothing special because it's Absolutely. the European duster, right? The European duster is a tool. It's a workhorse. So does it have an interior? Yes. Why does it have an interior? Because it kind of looked naked without it. But that's why it had an interior. Did it have a functioning AC? Yes, because it does get cold and it does get hot. No fanciness. But we were both impressed at how well it drove and how easily we were able to 
manage the speed limits, which in France are very heavily enforced. So you never cross 110 or whatever. Hmm. And then we came back and I was assigned to go to the duster's first drive. Hmm. So when I showed up in the room, you know how I am at briefings, I never say anything. And they're briefing about the duster and all that. And then I made a comment that clearly said I had driven the duster before. And hmm. then everybody's like, where did you drive the duster? And hmm. I had. Hmm. And then when I saw the interior for the Indian duster, it was like a completely different thing. But the value of that car in terms of how well it drove, that ride quality, how the engines worked and all that translated. Right. So I knew walking into the briefing that if they were to be able to get the sense of value correct, correct. where an Indian customer paying that kind of money would not feel like he's getting the cheap European SUV. Right. That he's getting a reasonably premium SUV for the money, this product would work. And it did. They refined it for India, the interior. And despite it being Spartan or still, you know, fairly basic, people saw such an incredible association with the car, right? In terms of experience that so many people chose to overlook that and still go with the duster. And it was so good that Nissan also did their version of the duster. Right? How did that work? Did the Terrano actually do anything? Yeah, actually, it actually did well for them. And people, and, and the great thing is for the brands in that sense and for customers also because they looked at the two products as different products because they looked, looked different. Mm -hmm. And they were like, yeah, that's a, that's a different vehicle and this is a different vehicle. Okay, which one do you think was better looking, the Terrano or the Duster? I prefer the Duster. Because of the all-wheel drive? No, the way it looks, right? So the way it looks, I, I, I just like the hood of the Duster, somehow the way it worked with the headlamps. It gave it a very nice muscular look, which I really enjoyed. The Terrano had a little bit more bling to it, which was great in that sense. But what did you prefer? Clearly, you have a pick. The Duster. <laughs> Because the Terrano sort of approximated the Nissan SUV design at the yeah. time when the X-Trails and all of these were having those, you know, like the tailgate had that shape. But I knew inside that it was still a duster and badge engineered and all of that. And I don't know, but somehow I never gave it that much credit as much as I would look at a duster on the road and say, oh, duster, uh, Terrano, it's okay, right? So talking about Spartan cars, the ETOS comes to mind, right? Oh, yeah. No, uh, I was part of a drive where we drove the ETOS from Delhi to Calcutta. Okay. Uh, two days. And it was brand new at that point of time. And right. it was fantastic. Right. And the interior was not fantastic. Now, if I were to find that ETOS again today, so many years later, maybe three, four lakh kilometers on it, I'm convinced that that car will look exactly the way I found it when it was new. But we just didn't like that car at all. Yeah. What happened there? It, was there a value equation issue? Because it's a, it's a Toyota, I mean, after all. I think uh, that's, again, a question of, you know, we are looking for substance. Like, so the duster, in that sense, is a great example of there being solid substance. And uh, the appeal aspect of it is kind of compromised, but you make peace with it, right? Toyota came into India with their first set of mass market cars. And they, they built something which, and anybody who's driving a Leva or a ETOS today as well will swear by it, saying that, my, my God, it's dependable. You can go wherever, do whatever, and all of that kind of stuff. But did it work for you emotionally? Not at all. Because not only was it the interior of the car, even the exterior of the car was, was well, very average. It, it, felt, it felt basic, right? It's not, you wouldn't fault it for engineering. Mm. But it didn't talk to you, right? And we are still, like we keep saying, right? We are in the, in, we are the first, most of us are first generation car buyers. It's aspiration. It is desirability. It is living your dreams, right? In that sense. Mm. So when you're buying a car that's 8, 10 lakh rupees, it you want to feel special in that sense, right? You know? Okay, so how does an Indian customer get to the sense of, oh, this is a valuable purchase and this is not a valuable purchase? What do you think the components are? You know what the funny thing is? There are enough studies about this, talking mm. about it. Aesthetics come right on top. Mm. There's no two ways about it. Features used to be somewhere lower down the ladder in that sense. That's climbed up. Uh, yeah, because we need to stick our kids through the sunroof, right? No, we don't. No, but airing out your kids is a very healthy practice. You must air them out regularly or they smell musty. If I can't beat them, I'm going to try and join them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's how they dry their hair off, right? You wouldn't know about that. Okay, uh, so yeah, features have become more important. So p for people, that emotional attachment is very, very prominent. Like in features also in that sense is about feeling good, mm. right? The functional aspects of it, for sure. Like I think fuel efficiency is pretty important for people. And looking at where the fuel prices are today, 
that's becoming even more relevant for people. So I think fuel efficiency has been up top, but it's not the number one thing in that sense. Mm. Aesthetics are the number one. So you can't make a fantastic ugly car and expect it to sell. No. But you can make a no. terrible car that looks awesome and it still might do a job. Absolutely. So I have a different theory about this. Huh. And it comes from the motorcycle world because hmm. that's a larger chunk of buyers. Hmm. I think until we become an affluent country as a general rule, we will not fully express our preferences and desires with our money. Hmm. Which is why when you go to a Porsche, Lamborghini, Ferrari, Ducati, Aprilia, Big Wing, you're expressing your feeling okay. by saying, I like, I like this bike, but I don't like that bike. Functionally, what would you do with both of them? It's not very different. Nice. If you were to buy a Lamborghini in India, what are you going to do with it? Okay, apart from being a social media star, what else are you going to do with it, right? It's not very useful. But at the other end of the spectrum, I think the safety of... Oh, you've got something funny going on. Say, 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 say. So in supercar world, Lamborghinis are, ex are, are a little bit special for me in that sense because... You can enjoy a Lamborghini even at standstill. Yeah. Because it looks like it it makes me a child instantly. I don't have to drive it. I just have to look at it and say, that's ridiculous. So Ferraris don't do that for you? No, Ferraris don't do that for me. Uh and also the sound, hmm. right? They are meant to be loud, wild. I mean, this has nothing to do with driving. You know, this is back to our optimist realist uh, divide in the middle, right? Because to me, I look at Porsches like that. Uh, I see a Porsche and I want to appreciate it because I say that thing will go fast. That thing will go around corners really well. And I can drive it every single day without having to worry about it. Yeah. I will never think about a Lamborghini like that. You know, it's it's it, a Porsche is something you will appreciate as you develop as a driver, right? As you evolve as a driver and you drive, right? Then you understand the nuance and the beauty of the car. The Lamborghini, it's like your... It's, it's like anybody can appreciate it, right? And you don't... Probably as you get more cultured and all, you'll you'll say, yeah, you want different flavors and tastes and all of that. But Lamborghini at standstill will get anybody and everybody's attention. Just the startup, it will, people will do a double take and... Did you just call yourself a child and me a grown-up? Because I that's never been done before. I'm a pretend adult. I am a total non-adult. I don't know why he's <laughs> classifying me like that. But He chose to do that. The, 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 the point I was making is, <clears throat> at the other end of the spectrum, I think if you think about a guy who's buying a Splendor or an Activa, they are committing a significant part of their annual income to that one purchase. So the primary thing for them is that this has to be a safe purchase. It shouldn't go wrong. Correct. And going wrong has multiple connotations. The easiest one to understand is, oh, it shouldn't break down. Correct. But it should also not go wrong in terms of status. Yep. Correct. To me, the Nano's biggest problem was not that it was a bad car or a good car. It was labeled as the cheapest car. And I don't know of any Indians who would like to be proudly telling their neighbors that, hey, you know, there's no cheaper car on the market and I have that one. Right. I don't think that works in our country yet. So if you look at safety of purchase has a component of status, which is people should look at the car and say, yeah, he's got a good car. The other side of it is that it needs to be a safe purchase, which will be reliable, which will do the job I want it to, etc., etc. When you put the two and two together, you can see why the market share looks like it does. Right? Because the Splendor guy, like I told you, that guy buying the fourth Splendor, he's buying the fourth Splendor on the assumption that my last three and my brothers and my mamajis and my chachajis worked so well. Hmm. It's a safe purchase. Absolutely. But a Splendor is also the bedrock of the commuter. You can't go wrong with a Splendor on any of the levels, including status. It's the same reason why I think the Activa is perhaps the worst scooter deal on the market. But it will remain the market leader for a long time simply because Honda can't change it anymore. It's not their product to change. Literally, it's a customer's project, right? Customer says, Mere ko to Activa hi right. So as many jokes as we make about 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, 9G, 12G. Where are we at right now? You really think I track that? <laughs> <Just> <laughs> so no matter what the jokes are, huh. it's what that customer specifically wants. And everybody else in the competition, including Honda's other product lines, are busy trying to give you the alternative to the Activa, which is clearly not working as well as the Activa itself. Right. But you know, my thing is, it will change. Because if a safety-oriented marketplace accrues to the market leader, then the next question to me is, will we remain a safety-of-purchase-oriented marketplace for a long time? Because we are getting richer as a country. Yep. Our standards of living are going up, incomes are going up, your access to vehicles is going up, the roads to drive them on are going up. If everything is on the up and up, then to me, the next thing that happens is that we start to be able to take our money 
and think of it as more disposable than usual and then express our lifestyle our preferences individuality yeah. individuality so to me if you look at the 400 cc class of motorcycles you look at the 650s you're already seeing a large variation in terms of what people are willing to purchase and if you remember the enthusiast podcast we did what did we say we said there is a key class of commercially viable number of indians who are willing to express themselves which will lead to many sku's for a manufacturer but many options for a buyer and those buyers should be allowed because they are ready and if the manufacturer won't do it you will lose their faith which ties back to the idea that i am saying now that we are not brand loyal we are value loyal if ktm refuses to sell me a 1290 will i wait for ktm to sell a 1290 no i just move on so i think see if, if the splendor parallel would work well with something like an alto or an 800 right because that value that you're talking about yes which is why as you said right at the start they are the market leader for a reason it's not uh, because of aesthetics but there's that core value right which is in the case of maruti is um, accessibility right not in terms of price point but there's a dealership just about everywhere there's a service center everywhere so that safety is of course a part of that uh, package the value that people are looking for but at the at the same time uh, on the flip side there's reno with the quid right they broke into a segment with a car that is very different right mm. it was a different approach to that segment and they managed to make inroads into a segment which most people have given up think about it hyundai got the eon right mm. the eons e- ago it was i think uh, i think yeah fair enough <laughs> good one so the eon right and the eon yeah it 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 also tried to take a different approach it went up market it gave, got very uh, dramatic styling for a small car and all of that but has it managed to did it manage to do what the quid has done no but the quid made those inroads by saying hey, i'm going to give you something different i understand i don't have the reach but i can give you the appeal i can give you a little bit more practicality and maybe you like it mm. and people did is it is it rivaling the alto uh, in that sense no it's not but it's made ground and that's a big deal in a market like us i think it, that's exactly it right it provided value it was more up market in the way it looked it offered better uh, cabin experience it offered more features it offered a little bit more practicality there you go it- so that begs the question it seems fairly obvious to both of us that value creation as a for a product by product should not be too complicated a problem to solve i'm going to smile so how is it that so many products don't manage to click and fall by the wayside i mean did nobody at toyota look at the etios's interior and tell the guys who were designing it saying hey listen it looks like a cab mm. i mean you don't have to articulate it even right it looks like a cab it doesn't look like a family sedan right so you've got the exterior in the zone the engineering is on point but it looks kind of basic yeah these kind of how do how does a large manufacturer with a whole bunch of teams dedicated to the process of creating a purchasable vehicle miss stuff like this how can the fortuner it seems like i'm hating on toyota but how does the fortuner interior not keep up with the exterior hmm. why does the hilux interior not feel like a 50 lakh rupee car that it is how do we miss those things right i think uh, so w- couple of things that you said keywords large right um multinational right so i think where the priorities lie often decides the course of these products and that's it if to us it seems galling or just so obvious but it's that much more difficult right um, to get right it's when you turn the focus on and say that this is for this market then suddenly things will st- all start pointing in the same direction right i think that it's easy for us to underestimate the challenge of trying to get tens of thousands of people to point in the same direction uh, and there the systems should be designed to do that but often enough i think that's not the case because if you're talking about it's today we are seeing uh, indian ceos leading multinational companies for the indian wings right this was not the norm earlier mm-hmm. right we are seeing it more and more often now uh, and that's great because they understand the indian market and it's taken so much time for companies to understand that this market is different you have to understand the nuances of right and so you're saying the idea that i will burn my fingers all the way up to my elbow before i wake up to the idea that indians want something different 
and therefore maybe indians in higher management positions and being listened to actively is a more profitable way to do business is the process that everybody has to go through there's no shortcut to it it's shocking but that's the case wow. and this is this is not the and this is something that i think happens in india not necessarily you don't see the same thing in north america hmm. right in north america the approach will be different there'll be a american leading the local uh, company it happen it happens over there i don't know why it's not happened over i think that's been an oversight in that sense or maybe a lack of uh, sense of competence or understanding of how the global systems work mm. and which is why this kind of hand holding was considered necessary but i think today that's t- that tide has turned i think we are seeing uh, more and more companies having indian heads it's is, is it also because the indian market has grown in preeminence and importance in the big picture anyway because we were not the very large car market for a long time but today we are on the cusp of becoming the largest right. we were one of the most populous two wheeler markets but we are now the largest right. two wheeler market and as much as the premium manufacturers keep complaining about there are no sales there are no sales there are no sales the reference point that they use is the entire indian two wheeler market as a mm. percentage point mm. if they were to just start contrasting themselves against other markets mm. where you take the 650 cc plus numbers and take them anywhere right we are already among i think the top yeah. 20 markets on 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 earth yeah which is why i keep coming right to the point saying hey listen don't be lazy yaar if you're going to do it you might as well do a yeah. good job of it right if i remember the number yamaha used to sell 253 skus or something in portugal i'm talking 10 14 years ago their net sales for the year were 18000 or 20000 motorcycles right but in india <laughs> that's so laughable <laughs> it's <laughs> Yeah. Right. I mean, if if I were a business guy, and thankfully I'm not, mm-hmm. but if I were a business guy, I would say, hey, listen, if Portugal can sell twenty thousand Yamahas with two two hundred and fifty three SKUs mm. and make a profit every year, mm. then in India, a team of five people running that business model here, selling to a very small number of people and ensuring that they turn their own profits out, should be able to get back on its feet, break even in a year and a half or two, and then be. gently profitable if not outrageously profitable almost immediately afterwards right so the blindness is basically coming from the volume right but the blindness is what i was discussing when we got distracted into my favorite topic <laughs> which is why did it take so long for them to realize that the best person to tell you what will work in india should ideally be an indian guy i don't have an answer for that one man for sure i mean i wish i did but uh, i don't but at the end of the day I, 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 there was an interesting thing that you just said right volumes getting getting swayed by volumes right and i think those volumes have uh, have created trouble for so many brands right because you look at the size of the market and you think ah this is going to be amazing uh, at the same time catering to the indian market but not really getting a sense of what will work or what what should be right for your brand i think has been a catch right and uh, on the two wheeler front suzuki right for years they went on with the sling shorts and uh, heat and zeus my two favorite commuter oh, yeah. of all time the the gs150 the higher th- i mean i don't even remember what they were yeah right and then the access happened they did something which was right for the indian market had their values in place right it worked it built brand suzuki in that sense and until the next tipping point where they said Hey, you know what? We 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 are not we are not we are not here to make commuters. Hmm. We are not good at that. We make great motorcycles, and so they started doing the uh, the jigsaw. Correct, right? And that was the tipping point again for them. Which is why I have these two things that I always say, right? I said if an MNC comes into India, first they will not listen to the Indians, and they will burn their fingers all the way up to here. Then they will say, hey, wait, this method that we've tried in so many other countries, maybe I don't know. Hmm. we've tried this method and it doesn't seem to work in india at all so maybe we should ask the locals as to what they want which is hmm. i mean when i say it in that sentence it sounds almost imperialistic but i know that it's not it's not a malicious thing it's just a business process thing right, right. in suzuki's case for example hmm. it's something that i say quite a bit and i say the first reasonably good product that opens a segment hmm. has a great chance in india of being the market leader for that segment and if it becomes the market leader then for the next 18 20 years it's a pot of gold that will right. keep giving all you have to do is break that segment with the first reasonably good product more excellence can come later mm. but it doesn't dent the confidence of the market leader at all mm. honda activa splendor access for the 125 cc scooters 
Pulsar 150. This is just the motorcycles. Then you take all the various Marutis that dominate everything. So you have the Alto, you have the Desire. And if you take the Creta, how many cars have competed uh, the, with the Creta? Exactly. The two yonder is in that sense. The Creta has been, uh, I mean, it's it's called the Creta segment, you know, for a reason. It just came out of nowhere. And at the same time, the I-20 as well. I-20 created that segment. And it was, it had that leadership and authority for so long in that space. Mm. Right? It's just because, I don't know if you know the I-20 story. Uh, it's it's an interesting little bit. So they were making the I-20 in India and exporting it from here, mm. right, to Europe. And uh, they said, since we're already making it here, why don't we sell whatever, you know? It's okay, we're making it here. Let's sell a few. And boom, right? Mm. I-20 exploded. That first gen, I don't know if you remember, yeah. uh, that that car was such a good-looking car. Was a and who in the world thought that you could sell that big a hatchback, right? We are we are that market, right? Where everybody wanted sedans mm. and because it was a bigger car and then this hatchback comes along which costs as much as a sedan and people are like, yeah, we want more, right? And that's how that segment boomed, right? So being first, I think being able to offer something that's unique, valuable, works. So the last time we discussed this, Akash was talking about uh, being number one is a very challenging thing to do and being number two is a non-challenging thing to do. And it uh, brought home something that TVS does rather well. And I don't know that if it is an active business strategy or not. But I just realized that TVS has a whole bunch of solid number twos in various segments. Right. They're not number one in practically anything, I think. But they are number two solidly in multiple places and they're India's third largest motorcycle manufacturer. Mm. Because being number two is much simpler than being number one. Mm. Number one means you have to innovate, you have to you know keep hold on the summit of the mountain as it were and keep everybody off the summit, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of work. Mm. Number two means, yeah, you stay there. It's okay. We'll be 30% behind and that's fine. Mm -hmm. We know exactly how to benchmark you and beat you. Right. We don't need to beat you in sales. We'll beat you elsewhere. But if I can do it in five or eight segments, I've got a great business model that requires a lot less work and energy. Right. Like, I think you think about the Apache fantastic family right but it followed the pulsar we have now the ronin which is trying to do uh, royal enfield in that sense badly um the one thing that i always wondered about why did tvs never come with an adv or an off-road product right they've had that history of racing competing for decades and that's never come and that when you pointed out it just stares at you that yeah why did it not didn't that make sense? They have everything. They have the ability to engineer. They have the mindset. So no brainer. And we still don't have anything. No. We still don't have anything. Yeah. But to me, from the last podcast to this one, I, I think the first reasonably good ADV is still out there. It's not come. Yeah. I think this will be the year. And that was, I think, the entire thing that we discussed in the previous episode yeah. uh, of the podcast. But to me, that those positions are still open. And I think if you can become the market leader, then that money that you spent innovating and trying to find a new place for yourself actually pays back very well in India, right? right? And as I was talking to you about this, I also realized that if you look at the market shares in the premium segment, they are not this universally directed towards one brand. Right. Mercedes might dominate uh, premium car sales, but it's not 90% and everybody else has 10%. It's more equitable. They've actually just cycled through, you know, like it was BMW for some time, there was Correct. Audi for some time, there was Mercedes for yeah. some time. Like because I think the fundamental difference is the safety of purchase as a quotient of value. I don't think a Mercedes-Benz buyer is dedicated to Mercedes-Benz. He has some values associated with it. So to maybe he thinks an E-Class is a more valuable purchase than a 5 Series. You know, this is where I think I would defer a little bit because the one thing I've come to realize, a, a luxury car purchase is not a logical purchase. It's an, I mean, cars generally are an emotional purchase, but a luxury car, all the more so. That's right? what I was coming to actually. Okay. The, the, what I, the point I was making is yeah. that there he has the capacity financially to say, okay, if there is a little bit of a price difference between the A6 and the 5 and the E, it is not a consideration. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now I'm aiming for something. Right. Now, if everybody in the colony I live in seems to have an E class, right. then the powerful reason to have an E class is to fit in. Right. But a powerful reason to get an A6 or a 5 series is to not fit in and say, <laughs> you guys all have Mercedes Benzes. Right. I have something else. Yeah. It's a completely emotional, non-rational decision. But I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, I'm coming back to the same point. When I'm saying at the bottom of the market, we have two halves of the market almost as it were. 
at the bottom we want our purchase primarily to be safe and safe primarily from two angles one is what did i pay for and the other is what will people think of what i paid for mm. and if you can solve those two you should have a reasonable shot at success obviously market leaders dominate that part of the market at the other end of the market though we do have money yeah the rich indians are very rich right and they are expressing themselves left right and center with their money buying things that don't logically make sense yeah some of these are practical purchases like a family sedan and some of these are not like a g wagon yeah that's a great purchase yeah it's a great purchase i i totally love how it looks there's nothing wrong in indulging and th- this is the thing right like people when they are spending like we are talking about india right and even today when people are buying luxury cars they think 10 times because they feel guilty about spending so much money on a car and all that kind of stuff and i always tell people that listen an emotional need is just as important as a actual you know physical need in that sense if it makes you happy there's nothing wrong in it if you have the money indulge it's fine there's more than that i i would i would tell you to add a sentence that i love to use and i think if you've watched any of my work you've heard it before money only works when you spend it <laughs> it doesn't do anything else <laughs> yeah correct <laughs> right so if you've got money you're feeling like you are spend it i mean what else are you going to do with it right let's sum it up for the buyers what should the buyers take away from our discussion right i think the first idea is evaluate your idea of value a little bit more consciously because you are using unconsciously a large part of it to f- inform your purchases right and there i would remind you as i like to always that value for money for its own sake is not a great deal it's not a great deal because it ends the moment you've left the showroom and your life with the vehicle starts exactly you've heard this before from me and i know it will get boring eventually but i will keep telling you this until i think it's settled in this is why i don't value discounts much mm. it's not because i'm well off the bike or car should be worth purchasing before the discount added the bonus for it honda just discounted the cb 300f by 50000 rupees and immediately we got a whole bunch of dms and messages saying is it worth buying now mm. okay first i haven't ridden the bike so i don't have a first person opinion on it but i trust the uh, auto car and zig wheels and whoever for their opinion on this they went to hyderabad uh, to ramoji film city or whatever they rode that bike and came back and saying unspectacular and a little boring and little hard to understand but the shoot was great mm. because the setting was great yeah, location was great if the bike wasn't appealing emotionally first time around making the price 50000 rupees less is not going to make it emotionally appealing today right. it's just easier on your wallet right. easier on a wallet is a temporary thing Hmm. emotionally deficient is a permanent thing and i would just rather favor a bike i had a good time with hmm. than a bike i bought cheaply hmm. and I, do you think that's how car purchases should also work the first thing that you said um, i think is what people need to understand right know who you are know what your needs are right when you identify those only then will you be able to pick something that makes sense for you right if you are going to buy a sedan just because everybody else has a sedan and you actually don't need the boot space you could have spent on a hatchback which gives you as much cabin space with more features and probably with an automatic instead of a manual you could have spent your money better to serve your need you're not a driver driver per se okay pick a vehicle which pampers you more right you can choose then accordingly right having that understanding the same thing with the luxury segment right being able to identify why you're making a purchase is so important it's not you might think of cars or motorcycles as you know being equal right that they are all everybody has the same engineering level and how how, how different can they be it's not true they are different right you are different right you have to accept those realities within you what are the different needs that live within you and pick accordingly because when you put that little bit of thought into it you'll suddenly find that it's not just transport it's a lot more rewarding and there are people who are doing work better than others right and will work for you better yeah and i think i would tell people to hurry up and do this fast hmm. because <laughs> once autonomous cars come <laughs> i don't even think you'll need to own one right you'll just order one when you need it yeah. and something will show up and take you where you need to go and you will be like this on your phone like the entire time that you're in the uh, car right 
at which point all this emotional decision making and all that perhaps will not be needed <laughs> at all it'll be more feature oriented but again <laughs> i think the emotional process of working out who you are what kind of vehicles would you like to drive is a very important part of who you are as an automobile enthusiast and as a human being who may not have such a strong association with automobiles do it now before your time runs out so i'm going to give a example on this front uh, is absolutely right uh, like the busa right i bought the second gen the last one of the second gen right this was a very conscious need in me that i didn't want the one with traction control with wheelie control with launch control and all of that i wanted it simple i didn't i knew that it would probably not be the latest and the greatest boosa in that sense but it was right for me right so which is why i i it finally that is what uh, you know pushed my hand in that sense was to buy the boosa was because i knew i wouldn't be able to get it after that the second gen so it's it can be weird things like that and it's absolutely okay but once you recognize it you'll be able to identify what it yeah. is that works for you right yeah what so go rationally it. recognize the irrational part of your purchase absolutely. and you figure out how important is it to you and if it is important if it feels important then nothing should distract you fantastic point at which to say disconnect